All right, it's 3.30 now. I think we can get started and latecomers will join us as they come in. Thank you for joining and welcome to the Business of Business Fireside series. Before we begin, I'd like to ask all attendees to please change your screen name so it reflects the company or organization you represent. This will be helpful when you ask questions, which you can do via the Q&A or chat buttons at the bottom of your screen. My name is Boris Spiewak. I'm Director of Marketing at the Business of Business and Thinknum. The goal of these talks is to connect successful leaders in creative domains to those in the next generation who are deeply interested in technology, business, and investing. The Business of Business Fireside series aims to inspire young and ambitious talent from varied economic backgrounds. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Marty Chavez, who will be interviewed by Greg Ugui for our inaugural Fireside Chat. Marty served in a variety of senior roles at Goldman Sachs, including Chief Information Officer, CFO, and Global Co-Head of the Securities Division. Marty has achieved singular acclaim on Wall Street for his work on SecDB, a platform that transformed the trading business into a software business. SecDB is Goldman's primary analytics and risk management platform. It is estimated to involve millions of lines of code, and the Wall Street Journal calls it Goldman Sachs's most valued trading weapon. He was among the most senior Latinos on Wall Street, as well as the most senior openly gay executive at Goldman Sachs. Marty is also a successful entrepreneur, having co-founded Keodex, which was acquired by SunGuard in 2004. Greg will be the interviewer for this episode. Greg is co-founder of Thinknum, KG Base, and the Business of Business. Most importantly, he was my roommate in college. He was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria, before winning a full ride to Princeton, and then starting his Wall Street career as a strat at Goldman Sachs. Welcome, Marty, and thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Welcome, Marty. Hello, Gregory. How are you? Very well. So I, I guess the first question I'd like to start with is with SecDB. So how did you begin like to build that? And assuming like today you had to you had to, you know, take on such a challenge, how will you prepare? How will you learn to build something like that? So let's see. Oh, good question. I mean, you know, you know SecDB too, so you can uh, assess for yourself whether it uh, lives up to the Wall Street Journal's build, building or not. I'll tell you how, how it uh, showed up for me. So I never planned a career in finance, never even occurred to me. Most of my college class, I'm class of 85. Uh, a lot of people went to Wall Street, then the 87 crash happened, and then they went and did other things. So I'm, I'm, I basically don't know anybody from the class of 85, right? But the, the who's on Wall Street? And for me, it was just a freak occurrence. I was, I was in an MD PhD program and I was just dissecting cadavers while the stock market crash happened. So I had other, other problems. And then just kind of out of the blue, uh, I got a, a, a letter from a headhunter. And this is in the days well before LinkedIn uh, where he had done some, some work. Uh, Armin, who you'll know from Goldman, <laughs> Armin um, had told this headhunter, and this is 1993, I want you to make a list of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley with PhDs from Stanford in computer science. And I was just on the list. How do I know that? Uh, well, because uh, my, well, not roommate, but office mate shared a little cubicle with, um, who is, is vastly more successful, um, uh, got the same letter. And he and I were both working on machine learning. We were both really depressed because the compute power was too low. We were looking for other things. He had the bright idea of applying machine learning to help people figure out what movie to watch. And of course, my my office mate is, is Reed Hastings, uh, founder of Netflix. And uh, anyway, I, I went to I went to Goldman, and so I I joined this crazy group of three people who were had this ambition of building a single piece of software where you could put all the trades, all the time series, all the models, all the risks, all the reports for Goldman Sachs, which was a crazy aspiration because we barely had the buy-in for the foreign exchange business. Like barely, I mean, Armin would tell us, you know, just 
pretend you're doing things for the foreign exchange business, but you're actually going to be building this core infrastructure that's going to be so powerful. It's going to let us ask counterfactual questions like, what if dollar yen were here? What if interest rates were there? And it's going to tell us the answer. And that's going to give us an edge. That was, that was Armin's vision. And we were executing on it. And so I arrive at Goldman and they say, would you please write an object-oriented, uh, transactionally protected distributed database in C from scratch? And I thought that was completely crazy. Um, I think I was, I don't know, I was fortunate or unfortunate. I took a lot of CS classes, basically absolutely every topic, except databases. Maybe if I if I taken a database <laughs> course, I would have known what a, what a quixotic ambition it was to do this, but I didn't know any better. And, and, and that became um, the, the, the server uh, for SecDB. Nowadays, and this gets to your question, Gregory, um, we would recognize what the team built as DynamoDB. Like it's, right. it's very similar to Amazon Web Services DynamoDB, but it didn't exist in 93. And so we wrote it and we needed a scripting language where people on the trading desk could ask questions and get answers and do numerical analysis. And there was no Java, there was no Python, there was nothing. And so we wrote something, which you'll know very well called slang. So again and again, we just wrote all this stuff that just didn't exist. So if I were doing it now, um, uh, it's an amazing time to start this now, right? <laughs> like, uh, you know, I was thinking about dependency graphs. So I just, I just found a beautiful dependency graph open source package in Julia that does way more than what we ever did uh, with SecDB. So, so it's amazing that you can now build on top of open source at an abstraction level that is just light years beyond what we had in 93. So I, I, now it really becomes a, a stack, a software stack selection problem, which is hard in its own right. Right. Very interesting. So the one thing is like sort of when I go through your resume and you sort of talk about SecDB and then slang and then you just kept going, it does seem like you just had success after success after success. So one question I have for you is, was there any point in your career where you failed? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, it, it's biased, right? Like you, the, you, 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 you hear more, you see more, if you Google me, you'll just see a lot of stuff uh, written, right? Be careful what you, about anything you read on the internet, right? And, and more is written on the things that worked well than the things that didn't. I don't know why, uh, but I can tell you that I learned a lot more from the things that, that didn't work well, right? So as an example, um, I, your, your roommate mentioned Kydex. We, we pronounce it that way, slightly different. Um, well, look, was it a success? Was it a failure? I, it failed in that it didn't make me billions of dollars, but it succeeded in that it was one of a tiny handful, maybe 1% of software companies founded in 2000 that returned money to investors, right? Almost everything was a complete flame out from that, from that vintage. Why? Because they raised money at the height of a dot-com bubble. So I don't know, are we in a bubble now? Who knows? But I, here's what I learned from that experience. Don't believe any hype, especially your own, and certainly not the market hype, right? So when I started that company, with almost no effort, I raised $15 million practically overnight. It was straight downhill from there, right? That was the high point of the company because the dot-com bubble burst a week after I raised that money. And it became almost impossible for the next four years to raise any money at any terms, right? And yet, why do I think of it as a success? Well, it was because we returned money to investors and the my co-founders and I all went on to do interesting things. Uh, one of them is a senior partner at Goldman. Another one is a congressman, U.S. congressman from the state of New York. Another went on to become president of the New York Stock Exchange. You know, we all, we all did interesting stuff and Kydex really got us going. But why it was especially valuable is that we had raised some money 
And we had to build some software that got to cash flow break even with real cash paid by real customers who had the unbearable pain that only we could solve, right? All the hype went away and we just had the hard reality of selling subscription enterprise software in a time when no one had heard of the term SaaS. The term SaaS did not exist, right? So we had to invent all of that and invent all the software and the software had to work and it had to be on time and on budget. And that terrible, ruthless discipline really was what I brought with me when I, when I rejoined Goldman Sachs after Kydex. And I had the opportunity, and you were the victim of it, to apply that kind of ruthless methodology of getting software done on time um, at the scale of Goldman Sachs. So, so that's something I learned immensely from. I learned how to sell enterprise software. I, I would say I learned more lessons from that. And then my other lesson was you know, the, the dot-com, uh, sorry, the financial crisis, right? The, the, the collapse of 2008. I mean, that was an epic failure in every possible direction. For Goldman, it was not a financial failure, but it was a reputational uh, calamity. And so uh, digging ourselves out of that and then embracing regulation, right, which was something where I had a, 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 a role where I learned a lot. I, I was sent out to go explain our business to the regulators and build trust with the regulators at a time when that trust was completely absent. And so generally, while the failures were deeply unpleasant, um, they were really important uh, ingredients of later successes. Awesome. So you mentioned sort of, you hinted at something, sort of the discipline that you need to have with, you know, focusing on value to your customers and how like, you know, let's say I'm a young strat of, you know, Goldman and sort of you have to impose that discipline on the organization. So that's something I want to sort of explore because I struggle with it even today. How do you balance working on technically interesting problems that might be like cutting edge versus maybe more mundane tasks that actually move the needle commercially? Well, I, uh, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer that, right? I, uh, I, uh, I tend to have um, ideas that are sound with timing that is questionable, right? And you really, you really, you really need both, right? And this, this, uh, you know, you can have a great idea that's too early. Right. So, so when I look back with the investors in Kydex and we ask ourselves, like, well, with perfect hindsight, what would we have done differently? Well, our answer is we would have started it five years later. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that would have been that that would have been the main thing to have to have done differently. So, so look, I, I to, for me to even get up and do something, it has to have some edge to it. I just don't really get excited doing something that's been done before by, by, by lots of people. So sort of naturally I wanna do something different. That's a wonderful inclination, but it's also dangerous because maybe nobody will pay you a dime for that, right? And so I think, I think Armin, who uh, is the, the progenitor of Strats, at, at Goldman Sachs Strats Anywhere, he invented the, the, the term, um, and I, I was strat number 12, something like that. Uh, he taught me a lot how to balance what you, the way you described, right? Where he, he told me when I joined and I, I didn't really understand what he was saying when I joined Goldman Sachs in 93, but he said, I've told some oil traders that you're going to be working on their risk reports. So whenever you bump into these guys and he named them and he showed me pictures, right? And they ask you, how's it going on the oil risk reports? I want you to smile and say, it's going great. <laughs> Meanwhile, I, you're not gonna be working on that at all. You're gonna be building deep fundamental infrastructure that's gonna be valuable for all the businesses. But if I tell them that they're paying you today to do that foundational work for all Goldman Sachs, they're not gonna like that. So, so we're not gonna quite lie. But 
we're going to kind of, we're going to do both. We're going to do the foundational work. And then we're, we're going to also give them a steady drip of things that are useful for them today so that they'll keep paying the bill. And I think doing, doing both is a tricky balance, but it is generally the best way to proceed. Got it. So this is sort of a related idea. And in many ways, it might be the same thing. But one, one thing I want to understand is like for someone like you, you've done great technical work, but you've also been recognized for it. And especially with many young people, and even with myself, you wrestle with how much of it should I sort of keep my head down and sort of ship code, fix bugs, versus how much of it should I manage either trader's expectation or your boss's expectation? Like how much self-promotion is ideal? <laughs> well, uh, let's see. So I'll, I'll tell you how I managed it and, it and it worked out well. Is this a general recipe? I don't know, but it's, but it's generally, it's worked for me. So I show up on the oil desk at Goldman Sachs after doing a, a couple of years of what you would know as core, core sec DB. And I got there and I immediately recognized the environment. The environment had me flash back to when I was in seventh grade. And I had, I had uh, skipped sixth grade and I was really good at math. So I'd skipped a few years of math. So I show up in this seventh grade class and cause I'd skipped the previous grade, I'm expected to be just sort of a mediocre student but I was a good student and the current valedictorians, the valedictorians of that class up until that time wanted to kill me. Right, that was, I think there's no other way to describe it, right? And so uh, they, were, they were ruthless. And so I needed a coping strategy. And my coping strategy was identify the beautiful and popular people in the class and help them with their math. And I figured somehow that if I did that really well, that um, they wouldn't kill me. And I did do that very effectively. And so years later, I looked at the traders all around me and I thought these people are gonna eat me for breakfast. And so, but I know what to do here. I'm gonna help them with their math. I'm gonna become indispensable with their math. And so I turned to the trader next to me after understanding a bit of his reality. And I noticed a very simple and obvious thing. The market would close and it would take him another three or four hours to wrangle all the data sources and spreadsheets and, and, and terribly written programs to eke out a risk report and a profit and loss report. And I said, I am going to get you out of the door within 15 minutes of the market close and you will only have to press one button and I will do the rest. And I didn't give him the time frame but I did give him my commitment to do that. And he saw that time for him to get out the door shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it became true. By the time it became true, of course, I knew everything about the business and I was indispensable. So I found that to be a useful way to proceed. Like look around and make promises to important people that are gonna make their lives better and then deliver on that. And I found if you do that, the, 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 that's the best marketing. Anything that you attempt to do by crowing about your accomplishments or putting meetings on the calendar so you can, you know, claim you want mentoring, but actually talk about how great you are and campaign for more money. I don't find any of that works, but I find if you make someone uh, around you happier and more successful in their job so that they look good, that that just works every time as a strategy. So I know you were close to like Gary Cohn and when you left Goldman to go to Credit Suisse, he, he told you, if you have in your mind, give me a call. But then I heard like you, you regretted actually leaving Goldman, but you didn't want to call Gary first, just kind of out of pride. And I, obviously I admire you a lot, but to be honest with you, it seems kind of petty right in a way. And I, I just want to understand, like, how do you 
manage like sort of you put your heart and soul into your work and relationships but how do you manage that versus being just ego driven how do you differentiate like this is who i am versus this is what i do so that's uh, uh again i i've gotten i'm happier with myself now in this de- in that department uh that i that i have been at any other time in my life but it's still a work in progress and I can look back on my 32 year old whatever it was self and say do you know what with everything i know and being wiser and having more gray hair the right thing would have been actually for me on my very first day at the other firm to call gary and ask for my job back <laughs> right so i don't i don't think that pride served me um at all well in that area right because then i yeah, but but these counterfactuals are very very hard right because okay so so yes i think i would have been richer if i'd done that but i wouldn't have started kindex and i'm pretty sure that the brutal experiences of kindex during the dot com bust were an essential part of what worked so, well in my second tour of duty at Goldman. So so it's tempting to say well I should have just called Gary but you know what then then life took me down these other paths and so in retrospect I don't know um what would have been the right thing but I but I do know that ego reliably gets in the way. I would say I would say when it's your ego talking it it's almost always make, causing you to make poor choices. you know that that I'll just make as a definitive statement the hard part is how do you know when it's your ego talking well i think uh it is having friends and and people who love you who help you get calibrated to reality i think it's having external people um who uh, for me they've been coaches mentors sponsors right who sometimes i'm paying them and sometimes i'm not paying them but they increase my awareness about things that i don't know and i don't know that i don't know them so how else am i going to how are else they going to become known to me unless i'm actively working on all of this and you know meditation and you know, all of these things help um so that you can differentiate what what matters from the endless ego driven thoughts that run in all of our heads So it's sort of like with meditation and sort of like lifestyle choices. Like one one thing that sort of struck me is you quit drinking in 97 and this is about when you left Goldman to Credit Suisse. But it seems to me like I I don't drink. I quit drinking in college. But my experience has been drinking is sort of an important social part of business. Oh. So it's kind of like why did you quit drinking? Ooh, wow. <laughs> I don't know how much time you got uh on that one, but Look, I I will say I was uh for a long time I didn't talk about sobriety at all. Um it was of of the many parts of myself it was it was really probably the last one that I started talking about especially publicly and and here's what I discovered. I can't tell you how many times colleagues but perhaps even more interestingly clients have come up to me at these exact boozy industry events where i am generally the only non-drinker right and 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 this has happened a hundred times and they say mari i'm really it means a lot to me that you talk about this stuff because i i think i might have a problem and you're the only person i know who's in the industry and seems to have have figured it out and can we talk about it it didn't happen once or twice it's happened a hundred times all right now i uh, i stopped drinking i i think the simplest way to describe it is uh, with an old chinese proverb first the man takes a drink then the drink takes a drink then the drink takes the man and i was well into the middle phase and headed fast into the the third phase and 
So I, w- I had the good fortune, no personal virtue, um, to become aware of that. And some friends made me aware of that. And I started walking down a different path. I can tell you that one of my great fears was I'm, I'm in the oil business. Like, this is going to be a catastrophe. Like, every, everybody's drinking all the time. What, what, am, what am I even going to do or be if I'm not going out and drinking with the traders after the market closes and drinking with the clients at dinner and it's drinking, drinking, drinking. And, and I was going to Houston all the time. And there was, a, you know, in the, in the middle of the oil and gas patch, an awful lot of drinking. And, and I, I thought this is going to be a disaster for my career. And then I realized that's not real. None of that is real. That's just the liquor talking. It's just giving me reasons to take a drink, none of which are real, right? And so I would put, you know, you got a drink to succeed in exactly the same category as you got to play golf to succeed on Wall Street. I've never played golf. I've never held a golf club. It's just, it's never occurred to me as interesting. And and once I joined the board and we were asked to list our hobbies and I wrote my hobbies as running, reading, lifting, and listening to classical music. And one of my fellow directors said, those aren't hobbies. (laughs) Hobbies are golf. (laughs) right you know thank you for sharing your view on what counts as a valid hobby and and what does not um and ultimately i i took a lot of comfort in some advice uh that my mother had given me she had so much good advice on so many topics and 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 you have to say a little bit in spanish right so 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 we're all asking our question what will people say what will people say in spanish the same thing get it la gente and my, my mom would say to that question, que digan misa si puedan, which means let them say mass if they can figure out how to, which is a very, very polite way of saying, I don't care what they think, right? And so most, most of our fears about what people will say and what people will think are just a projection of our minds. Most people, are too busy worried about their own problems <laughs> to actually spend much time thinking about what we're doing. And ultimately I decided people caring whether I put alcohol in me is kind of as preposterous as, as people telling me you must eat cheeseburgers because we're all eating cheeseburgers together. Like you drink alcohol if you want to drink alcohol and maybe I do and maybe I don't. And it's really not your business or my business, what you drink. Why don't we all just drink whatever we want to drink and leave it at that. And I guarantee you that works. Awesome. So for the next set of questions, like you're someone I admire not just because you're rich or you've achieved certain success, but it's how you've done it. Like, and just values that it embodies. So in, when I meet people like that, I sort of like to ask like some more social oriented questions that I think about and I wrestle with. I think the first one that sort of comes to mind is when I worked at Goldman, like internally versus how other people viewed it, I wonder if there's a way large investment banks can better make the case for the value they add to society. Like I'm talking to regular Americans, like high school graduates, the meaningful, like impactful, creative work that is done every day behind closed doors. How can they tell that story better? Well, um, Look, during up up until the financial crisis, the the media strategy of Goldman Sachs was no, <laughs> right? There there was a press person at Goldman who who was known in the market as Doctor No, because whenever he was asked anything, he said no or we have no comments or just no <laughs> because it, it took too long to say no comments, right? And, and so there was no media strategy. And so when the, uh, the dot com, when, when, when the financial crisis occurred, keep mixing up all the crises I've been through, um, uh, when the financial crisis occurred, nobody had any idea about Goldman Sachs. 
it wasn't like Morgan Stanley where you might have seen a, a a brokerage office in your in your hometown, right? There, nobody had ever seen a Goldman Sachs sign because Goldman Sachs policy was we don't put our our logo on any of our buildings. <laughs> like the headquarters in New York doesn't have Goldman Sachs anywhere on the outside of the building. Same statement for all of them, right? So there was no public strategy because the view was always we're a wholesale bank. You, you, if, if you don't know what we do, then we don't care if you know what we do. <laughs> that, that I think was the approach. Well, that didn't work so well because after the financial crisis, in the absence of any knowledge about what was Goldman Sachs good for, people made things up. Like they survived the financial crisis, they must have caused it somehow. That was something that got made up and, and, and became really vivid for people in the endless retelling of it, right? So if you're not telling a good story, a compelling narrative about yourself, people will make up narratives about you. So that's one thing I learned. Now, here's another thing. When I uh, became co-head of the trading business, I did a little survey. I walk around the floor and I'd ask junior and senior people, what I thought of is a totally fair question. How do we make money? <laughs> I figure your, your partner's Goldman Sachs is okay for me, your division head, to ask you that question and, and, and see what you come up with, right? And then I would ask a related statement. What are we here for? What is our purpose? What is our mission? And, and it was so depressing, the answer I'd get. The answer I get from so many people on the question of what, what are we here for? What is, our, what is our mission? What is our objective? If you don't like the word mission. Um, or what are we maximizing? How about that? What answer do you think I got from most people if they could even come up with an answer as to what are we maximizing? Like making money for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, revenue. Right. Well, even more specifically, top line revenue, right? Yet more specifically, top line revenue with my name next to it <laughs> on somebody's dashboard. Right. That would have been the sad, the sad truth of it. But, but then I would say, how can that objective possibly be interesting to anyone other than you? And, and how could it be even remotely interesting to our clients? So, so time out, let's come up with like what it is we are here to do. And, you know, and, and, and the thought experiment is really pretty simple. If there were no Goldman Sachs trading business, nor any of its analogs or peers, like if that whole thing disappeared overnight, what would be different about the world? Well, here's the thing that would be super different about the world. If you own some financial assets, stocks, bonds, derivatives, whatever, you kind of be stuck with them. Right. right. Good luck selling it. If you suddenly wanted to turn it into cash, it'd be a lot like selling your house, maybe worse. Put it on the market, find a broker, show it a hundred times, you know, wait nine, 12 months, right? That's that's what the reality would be. And so what is the social purpose we serve? Our our purpose is you, the client, have something you want to turn into cash, or you have some cash you want to turn into other kinds of financial assets. You come to us and we do that for you. And we don't say, oh, you know, I don't really want to buy those stocks off you because I, I think they might be going down. Or, you know, we, we don't do that. That's not our job. Our job is to say, here's where we'll buy them and here's where we'll sell them. And we do that all day. So it really comes down to providing a valuable service to clients and then how we're going to do that risk transfer. We're going to do it in a highly automated way so we can do it in a scalable way, so we have more ways to manage the risk ourselves. And it's a virtuous cycle of getting better and better at turning the risk people don't want into the risk that they do want. And so now you're starting to have a narrative about why it is that we're good, we're good for the planet. But there's been very little of that, that work, sadly. When I was CFO, I, 
I, I, uh, I certainly gave it my best uh, to explain that that's the business because people would always ask me, well, the, the stock market's down. How come your, your results are good? Or, or the opposite, right? The stock market's up. How come your revenue declined, right? Because even people who should know better don't actually know that the business isn't really linked to market levels. And it, they don't know that because we haven't done a great job of, of explaining it to them in plain English. Right. So that makes sense. I mean, it, it's sort of related to like a, a major thing that is on my mind. I came grew from a very poor family and I went to work at Goldman and you see a lot of creative people, they made a lot of money. So income inequality is something. And I think many people care about now. Like if you see a chart of, like what the bottom 50% earn, it's going down. And what the top 1% earn, it's going up. And there's sort of two schools of thoughts that I sort of read and study. Like one is, let's say, AOC. She says there should be no billionaires in the US as long as there are poor families that are struggling. And another one is, let's say, like Paul Graham. He's the co-founder of Y Combinator. And he talks about how income inequality is a natural part of capitalism. And it's a sign that the process is working the only way to reduce it will be to hurt the actual rich people you don't actually help the poor people so like if i'm in a race with usain bolt and we do a hundred meter dash and the gap is too much the only way to sort of reduce that gap is to hold usain bolt back because you can't make me run faster so if you have a <laughs> business person and you have elon musk over time you can only hold elon musk back so i would just like to know how do you think of income inequality is it a feature yeah. or well um, it is a consequence of the capitalist system as we've constructed it. Gregory, the thing that concerns me is that it's a power law. It's not a bell curve, right? right? So, you know, you, you, you look at me and you think, whoa, that guy's really rich. And I, I look at a, a whole bunch of my friends and like, they're, they're much richer. And then they look at Jeff Bezos and they feel like paupers, right? No, well, that's a power law at work. It's insanity, right? And, 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 and it, it also interacts with the basic feature of human nature, which is our entire nervous system is designed to notice differences, not absolute levels, right? And, and so we're only noticing the people who are richer than us and are poorer than us. Right, and, and, and then we're feeling good when we're richer than other people, it's terrible to say, and, and bad when we're, we're poor, even if in every way we're, we're doing fine, right? We just compare it. Um, this comes from AA, it's a, it's a great uh, adage from AA, compare and despair, they go together. Hmm. Now, at the same time, it isn't an inevitable feature of capitalism that the inequality be as extreme as it's getting. There have been long periods in American history where there was always inequality, but it wasn't this kind of inequality, right? And then you could also ask important questions about the distribution of income. And so maybe, Inequality is different if it isn't quite so extreme, and maybe it's differently perceived if there is some, some baseline and it's asymmetric, right? And just thinking pragmatically, what I would say to anyone who's a fan of pure capitalism, let, let me first say, I, I am not in AOC's camp right. at all. Right, I didn't vote for her. I wouldn't vote for her. I hear her, and she's just not, not saying things, anything that makes any sense at all to me. At the same time, I am a big proponent of a universal basic income. I, my personal view is that if you're just being pragmatic and looking at at, at an inequality and not thinking about um, some abstract concept of justice. You don't want the inequality to be so extreme that it leads to a revolution. So you ought to be prepared to pay to decrease that probability. This is what I say to 
you know, friends who you might call oligarchs, right? Why? Why it would make sense for everybody to have some baseline income and why we should all pay for it. So I just keep coming back to an old idea, um, John Rawls, The Theory of Justice. I don't know if you've encountered it, but it's a famous image that I think is very beautiful. And he calls it the veil of ignorance. A just society is defined in the following way. Imagine that we are not born into the world yet and the world that we're about to be born into is hidden from us by a veil of ignorance. We know the structures of the world, the opportunities, the way income and capital are generated and distributed, the roles that exist in the world. What we don't know is what role we're going to be thrown into when we're born into it, right? But we get to design the world, knowing that we could be thrown in in any of those roles. What kind of world would you design? And I would say that the world we have is very, very, very far away from that. So what are we going to do about it? So, so I have some something that keeps coming to my mind. I, I just propose and I'd like to see what you think. So what do you think, like, you know, you joined Goldman, it was a partnership, and then eventually you worked at Goldman and it was a publicly traded company and you were the CFO. So what do you think of abolition, like getting rid of equity for service-based industries? So like, it doesn't seem like fair to me, like, okay, Jeff Bezos started Amazon and he did great work, but is it right that he should earn dividends forever and ever and all the work great Amazon engineers will do? Or should it be more like a partnership, like in a law firm? So if you're a service-based industry, you're not allowed to have equity. You, it's the partners that are adding value will get a lot of money. So they'll be, you'll get rewarded, you get incentivized, but you can't own people's work forever. Hmm. Now this is, uh, look, I, I, I love that. I love that concept intellectually. Um, here, here, here's where it reaches some, some limits. It works very well for a law firm. What is the, what is the tail risk, the, the cataclysmic downside risk for a law firm? It is probably, it probably takes the form of reputational risk, I suppose, right? Though, though it seems to me that the accounting firms are the ones that have that tail risk. The banks have that tail risk. There aren't very many law firms that have gone out of business uh, because they got hit with some kind of malpractice or forced to pay based on a bad outcome for some advice that they've given. It doesn't, it doesn't happen very often, right? So, so the partnership structure makes eminent sense uh, for law firms. And I'm not aware of a uh, law firm that has any other structure. I mean, if there's a publicly listed law firm, I, don't, I, I can't think of it off the top of my, my head. Now, for a financial services firm of the kind that, that, that you see in Goldman Sachs, where if you look at that trading business I just described, you've got some risk you don't want, we'll buy it from you. You want some risk you don't have, we'll sell it to you. That, that can leave you holding the bag when a financial crisis happens in some really extreme ways, right? And, or as we've seen more recently with 1MDB, there can be all kinds of, of consequences, right? There can be clawback, you can, you can lose more money than you made again and again and again and again. And so, so this is the reason Goldman Sachs went, went, uh, went public because the problem it had the, that had become existential was it's a partnership. So when you go limited, you take your capital out. There is no permanent capital. If Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Lehman and the others had gone into the financial crisis without permanent capital, they would all have been wiped out pretty early on. Right. And so, so some businesses, you have to have permanent capital. It's in the nature of the business. And I get your point on Amazon, but Amazon, you know, look, I'm a, I admire it. Like to do, do, 
you know, does it make sense to me that that Jeff Bezos is likely to be worth two hundred billion dollars this year post divorce? Uh, you know, we could we could discuss that. Uh, at the same time, Amazon has done some some pretty amazing things, right? During during the pandemic, yeah, yes, it's capitalism at its most extreme, and also. I'm very happy for those Amazon packages that come every day, because what else are we going to do? And I'm very happy for all those machines out in AWS um, that we can, right? I, so somebody had to invent that, and somebody had to be awarded, rewarded for it. And, uh, and all those engineers um, signed up and got paid, and they got some equity too. Um, Bezos was there first. So, so I, I am not inclined to take away Jeff's uh, equity, right? And I, but I would think, uh, do businesses, you know, do businesses have a better alignment of incentives if it really is a limited partnership? And I think they do. I'm agreeing with you. It is better that way. How do you get those virtues and have permanent capital? I think it might be squaring the circle. I, I, I'm not sure how you do that. Right. That makes sense. And I, I think you sort of hinted at the sort of next thing that is on my mind, which is sort of like AOC or something like that. But like one thing is I sort of obviously I was like one of the few, you know, black people like in, in Goldman at that time. And I sort of observed you. And one thing is you were very active as Latinos in Goldman. You were very active in the LGBT community. You were very always true to yourself. At the same time, you weren't like sort of angry. Like, you know, I have a lot of friends that, you know, now they're sort of more and more getting becoming more like activists. And, you know, you spend a lot of time sort of like fighting with like proud boys on Twitter, you know, inevitably, you know, you yourself start being hateful, you know, I'm being close minded. So one thing I would like to sort of understand is how do you manage that? How do you manage being true to yourself and understand that you might get attacked for your identity, but you're still open and you're still willing to connect with anyone? Well, thank you, thank you for saying all that, Gregory. You, you and I were among a, a handful of people of color at, at Goldman, and there again, I would, I would thank my mom and dad. They understood anger, right? My my mom would would talk about how is that she and her family, when she was growing up, were, were, all they could think of was getting themselves out of the barrio. And then they finally bought a tiny little house and then the city came and built the sewer plant immediately next door. And that was that for the value of their house, right? She's, she's angry for sure. And she would talk about it a lot as a central event in her life. And we've been through it. You've been through it. I've been through it, right? The people who would say, um, oh, well, I mean, this actually happened. I remember when I when I uh, was applying to colleges, one of my dad's colleagues asked which ones I was applying to and which ones I got into. And my dad answered and, and he said, well, my my daughter would have would have gotten in too, but she didn't have the right last name. You know, there's there's always that nonsense out there and much, 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 much worse. Um, but my parents raised me in such a way that I understood, okay, anger is part of the human condition. And being angry, uh, unless it's righteous wrath that's turned into action, is a complete waste of time. And, and the best kind of uh, action uh, and my mom would always say this is just be an example yourself, be successful yourself. That's the, the greatest contribution you can make to other people of color. So if they, if other people of color think that there's a glass ceiling, show them that it's, there isn't one. And my mom would always say, you're Latin to get half as far, you're gonna to have to work twice as hard. And I don't wanna hear a single complaint, you better just get busy. And then when I came to realize that I was gay, I, 
I took that to mean, whoa, gay in Latin, two strikes. You know, probably have to work 10 times as hard to get one tenth as far. And I think that that, that served me really, that served me really well. And I'm just not, I'm just not an angry person and nor do I think it's a good look, nor do I think most of the time like that arguing, I feel like it would just diminish me and not give me anything I want, not give me peace of mind and certainly not make me richer. And so why, why pour any effort into it? Why not pour my efforts elsewhere? But I'm seeing the same thing, the same phenomenon that you describe. Um, I'm seeing my own family. Um, we're getting COVID PCR tests and having some people over uh, for New Year's. And, and I have a niece who she, she, she lectures all of us on how we are insufficiently Hispanic and how we don't understand race relations. And she's going to explain it all to us. And it's so extreme and so unpleasant that I seriously considered not inviting her, you know, and, and sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's not. And so if on New Year's Eve, she starts lecturing us, I'm going to just say, I understand that, um, that you're angry and this is my house and I'd like us to change the topic right now. <laughs> and so, you know, there, there's a time and a place for it. I don't know if I really answered it. It's just a some of my thoughts on the conversation. It was very, it was very powerful, and I, I think our moms are very similar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Maybe we had the same mom. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> so, okay, so, uh, so to be honest, we only have like ten minutes left. I have a lot of questions I want to ask, but I don't want to be greedy. <laughs> I, like, these are there are many things in my mind, and I can talk to Marty forever. But I'll, I'll you know, I think Boris is going to sort of involve the audience. Great. Right. They have questions. Wonderful. All right, thanks a lot, Marty. That was very insightful. Uh, we have some great questions from the audience. The first one is from Janet Yu. Janet, you have the floor. Hi, my name is Jeanette. Um, I'm a Spark slash CDG fellow from Close the Gap Foundation. And I wanted to say first, thank you for sharing your story, Marty. Um, and as a low-income student in high school, I was curious on your opinions on representation of social background and also ethnic diversity in your workplace, especially being a part of the LGBT community and also the Latin community, um, and also being in Wall Street. Um, what, whether you believe that the current diversity is ideal, or do you wish that there was an improvement in diversity? Um, and also any motivations that you have for low-income students as well. So well, thank you for your question. The, uh, the first part is easy to answer. It's far from ideal. Uh, we, uh, a story I love telling at one time I was in a, in, a, in a conference room and I was talking to another partner who was Hispanic. Uh, we weren't talking about being Hispanic at Goldman, we were talking about a deal. And a third uh, partner actually who happened to be our boss walked, walked by, saw us in the room, ducks his head in, um, leans in and says, 50% of the Hispanic partners of Goldman Sachs right here in this room right now. And then he closes the door and leaves, right? And so his point was just that there were, there were, there, there were six uh, out of the 400 Goldman partners who were Hispanic, um, which just can't, can't, doesn't seem like the right answer. And, and, and three of them were in that room right now. And so we're at, here is a, just a, a fact you observe everywhere you go, and it's not specific to Goldman or Wall Street. It's the same in tech. It's, abs it's absolutely identical in tech. So you look at entry level positions, and they reflect the demographics of the cities in which these companies operate. You look at the assistants, you look at the analysts. They might not be exactly on top, but you know these days at Goldman Sachs, um, if you look at the New York office, roughly 9% of the analysts are Hispanic and about the same percentage are black. This is relatively new. This hasn't been true for very long. But as you go up the ranks, whether you look at compensation or title, it doesn't matter what diverse category you look at. It could be black, Hispanic, LGBT, women, um, uh, different abilities, veteran status, it could be anything. And you will observe that percentage drop just as you go up in seniority until you get to the, the partners and there's one 
one, a little over 1% of the partners are Hispanic, starting from nine or 10% at the analyst level. And passage of time is not going to fix that problem all by itself. It's going to require active intervention, and it requires a lot of daily work, not grand pronouncements. Like one thing that drives me crazy is when companies say, we're going to focus on being more diverse. Focusing is not an activity. It's like, so, so what? I, do you want, you know, I, I knew at Goldman, we didn't pay people for focusing. We paid people for outcomes, right? And so focusing is not going to do it. And it requires actively intervening every single day to change the environment. So um, as for motivations and ideals for my personal life, um, that kept me going through the hard times and through the, through the obstacles, uh, I wish I could say there was one, one particular thing. Um, but if I had to come up with that, is my list of short, sacred, personal priorities. It's not like it's a great list or the right list or needs to be your list, but it is my list of top three priorities. And whenever I've got a choice to make, do I go left or right, choose A or B, go up or down? I look at those three priorities and I choose the one that is most consistent with those priorities in order. And I don't choose the one that is less consistent. And so my top priority is peace of mind. My second priority is family. My third priority is my, is my work. And so I would say having peace of mind at the top of the list makes me better for my family. And it's also kept me away from all kinds of things that might've gotten me in trouble um, through a long career on Wall Street. Thank you. Our next question is from Murat Uysal. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Murat, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thanks a lot for this great conversation. I would like to ask Marty if he is doing any angel investing. If so, what are uh, the type of teams that he uh, thinks will be successful? Hey, any angel investing, Rod, I, 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 I have... Uh probably a hundred plus angel investments. It, it seems like what I'm mostly doing these days, which is an incredible uh, privilege and it's a lot of fun. I think one of the best things of having worked on Wall Street for 26 years and, and worked at the intersection of finance and, and technology um, is that I've, uh, I'm uh, lucky to have a wonderful deal flow. Right, so several times a day, someone will send me an email that says something like, hey, Marty, I, I, I met this entrepreneur and what she's doing is so inspiring. This is a real story. Um, and I just put a bunch of money into her seed round. And in one case, um, my, this is my uh, mentor, Eric Schmidt. Um, he basically just shared with me that I was going to be her mentor. Um, and, and, and look, I, I immediately said yes before even meeting her uh, because he, he has a strong view, which I share, is that he received incredible coaching and he needs to pay it forward. He did that with me and I, I, I need to be doing that too. And of course I need to be doing that. So, so two or three times a day, some investor I know will talk about a deal, an entrepreneur, suggest advising or coaching. I'm on nine boards, so there's no more boards to, <laughs> that I could possibly be on, um, but advising is possible. And so this has led me to a wonderful set of investments um, where I typically have some advisor options and then I participate in the seed round. In a few cases, I'm on the board or I, I, I'm on the board of advisors in other cases. And um, I would say most of my investments have uh, an emphasis on machine learning. That's what I did for my PhD work. Um, and now 20 some, oh gosh, sorry, 30 years later, after my PhD was granted, we can actually start to solve interesting problems. So I'm really passionate about it. And in most cases, it's applying machine learning to problems in, in life sciences. So those are my angel investments. All right. Maybe we have time for one last question. This one is from Sol Solan, Soloncha. Sol, please go ahead. 
Hi, uh, Marty. Thank you very much for sharing your story. And uh, really, uh, it's really interesting to hear how you have taken your life and, and uh, achieved such success in the financial industry. My question for you is, how can the financial industry provide leadership in addressing climate change that has been considered an existential threat? And I know I believe you have some children. So looking to take responsibility for the future, how can the, the great uh, power of the financial industry be harnessed to deal with this? That's a fantastic question. I do have two young children, ages four and six. Um, they just got back from school and one of them is, uh, is screaming in the background in case you, <laughs> you heard some of that. Um, so look, this is one of our existential problems, uh, crises, and we have several. I would, I would say inequality in all its forms, income, racial, and so on. It's another one, and, 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 and there's a list of them, but these are, these are at the top of, of my list, I think anyone's list. And there is something to be done. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example uh, that is a live example. I'm president of the, the Harvard Board of Overseers, and uh, which is an incredible uh, role to have at any time, um, but especially at this time when we have a pandemic on top of all of our other problems. And Harvard's uh, worked out uh, an ambitious and what I would call essential plan. Um, there's, there's a debate, a raging debate about whether the plan goes fast enough, but it is committing the university to carbon neutrality, net zero uh, by 2050, but committing in, a, in an extremely broad way, which is the university itself will be carbon neutral. Yeah, that may, you may think that's no big deal, but when, when it's a, a university that's 400 some years old, um, there's a lot of old buildings and making them all carbon neutral is a multi, multi-billion dollar expense, right? In many cases you have to tear them down, but they're historic. And so it's even more complicated to keep them, but make them carbon neutral. But that's, that's the least of it. Then there's the endowment. So what, he, he, and this is something that financial services companies can do and are starting to do as well. So it's a, it's a 40 some billion dollar endowment. And First of all, we got to start with definitions. What does it even mean for a portfolio of financial assets to be carbon neutral? There is a discussion, right? Divest fossil fuels. I know that's extremely uh, satisfying in so many ways, and it harkens back to apartheid and things that worked to apply pressure to South Africa. My own view is that, that, that we can learn from that, um, but it's different for climate change. Right? I think defining fossil fuels and what is a fossil fuel stock, you know, get, it's very complicated in an economy that is entirely based on fossil fuels. So there's some basic definitional work, right? How do we take a portfolio and have it appropriately assessed as a carbon neutral portfolio? Is it or is it not, right? Pharmaceuticals ultimately are all based on the fossil fuel chain, right? So these definitional problems are really hard and places like the Harvard Endowment, other endowments, financial services firms are starting to look at that. I'm on the board of, uh, of Santander, uh, which is the largest bank in, in Europe. And Santander has an extremely ambitious program of carbon neutrality for its balance sheet, me and carbon neutrality in all the companies that it supports through lending, which is, which is tens of thousands of, of companies all over the world, right? So, so firms are starting to take this really, really seriously and, and regulators are beginning to take it seriously too. I, I, I can tell you from the personal experience of the financial crisis, when, when regulators start to turn their requirements into capital requirements that directly reduce your returns on equity, everybody starts paying attention to it. And this is absolutely coming and will make a big difference. I'll, I'll end by saying I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I, uh, you know, my dad lived for part of his life in LA and, in the 50s. And he said in the 50s, the skies in LA were pretty much black. And 
the prediction, and everybody assumed it was inevitably going to be true, is that the skies would just be even, even more unbreathable, and that would be the permanent state, uh, kind of the uh, Blade Runner view of LA, right? And that did not happen. And it didn't happen for a simple reason, which was unleaded gasoline, right? It made a very, very, very big difference. The problems we're having now are much greater, but our capacity to solve them is also much greater. And I think with all of these changes in incentives, um, demand from investors for, for sustainability, and a push from the regulators, some climate accords, uh, technological solutions, the ability to measure a portfolio and determine its carbon neutrality. Um, when all of these things come together, I am highly confident that we will figure it out. Thank you, Marty. Unfortunately, I think we're over time now. Uh, thank, thank you, you for all the attendees that came out and to Greg for the excellent questions. And we'll, I'm sure there'll be more opportunities in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. It was such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Be well. Very grateful. Take care.